So my name is Lee Klotz and I want to talk about uh, Commodore Logo. Um, so um, in 1979 I was a freshman at MIT uh, and I found the uh, Logo Lab, part of the uh, MIT AI Lab. And uh, they had previously developed uh, uh, Logo, the programming language for kids, uh, based on Lisp. Um, most of the work had been done up to about five years before. Uh, and they had a contract going on at that time uh, with Texas Instruments to make Logo for the TI. Uh, 994. Um, and uh, to that end, uh, one of the staff members, Gary Drescher, who's uh, now an AI researcher, um, had written a logo in Pascal because uh, TI had said that uh, they had a Pascal compiler. Um, so TI shipped uh, their Pascal compiler, which turned out to be a desk size unit. It was a piece of hardware, um, also with a TI 9900 chip in it. Um, and they compiled it, and it compiled maybe eight times uh, the uh, uh, size of the biggest available memory of the TI-994. So that didn't work out. Um, so they hired a uh, student uh, named Stephen Hain, uh, and uh, he set about being a, uh, a, um, a hand compiler for the Apple II. Uh, this was while the TI project was still going on. So the TI project was done in the 9900 assembly code. But they started this side project uh, to uh, compile it, to uh, translate it into 6502 code for the Apple II. This was under the direction of uh, Hal Abelson uh, and uh, Andy DeSessa, um, and then uh, ultimately Seymour Papert, who was the head of the Logo Lab. Um, and uh, Steve, uh, Stephen had finished that work uh, around the time that I got, uh, I got interested. Um, so, um, a friend of mine, Patrick Sobolvaro, uh, and I both uh, started working at the Logo Lab, so I took a break from school. Um, and uh, uh, my job was to finish up uh, the uh, logo for the Apple II, and uh, Patrick wrote the, uh, uh, the editor. We used uh, Emacs lot commands for it. And uh, eventually, uh, I was uh, tasked with, the, uh, with uh, finishing up the logo for the uh, uh, for the Apple II because um, the Logo Lab uh, lost its funding um, and Seymour moved to uh, France to uh, run a, uh, a research organization there um, with a bunch of other people. Nicholas Negroponte, I believe, was involved. He later helped found the World Wide Web um, Consortium, etc. Uh, so uh, at that time, uh, there was a question about how Logo was to be distributed. Would it be? Uh, would it be? Um, uh, things like open source and GPL didn't exist at the time, although um, uh, I, as others did, worked uh, with Richard Stallman and some other folks. Um, and uh, eventually, after some consultation, um, uh, Hal Abelson decided that the right thing to do was to go ahead with a uh, license agreement. And part of this was influenced by the uh, MIT Industrial Liaison Office, uh, because um, they uh, dealt with uh, royalties and patent rights and all of that from industrial research. And MIT felt that they wanted to uh, recoup some money. Um, and they also made an argument uh, that um, they wanted to uh, offer this through some companies that would have enough money to be able to develop uh, curriculum support, uh, enhance, uh, enhance, the, uh, enhance the product, and really push it out into schools. Um, uh, additionally, um, the uh, project had been funded by a National Science Foundation grant, and uh, up until that point, um, uh, the, uh, any money that came out of an NSF grant uh, did not flow back to the institution that got it, it went back to the U.S. General Treasury. Uh, but Congress had recently uh, passed a, uh, uh, some new legislation that said that the um, institution that got the grant got to keep the money. Um, so uh, this became a test case. So as far as I know, that was the first case where uh, money that came from a product that was licensed uh, from a university based on an NSF grant that the university got to keep the money. Um, and uh, they gave me a little bit, they gave Stephen Hain a little bit, they gave Hal Abelson a little bit, um, uh, etc. Um, and uh, that uh, uh, was uh, sort of the beginning of Logo um, getting out actually into the commercial market. There had been some efforts before with a custom PDP-11 solution and so on, but uh, they didn't work out. Um, so uh, I, uh, uh, another, another set of people a few years before, uh, led by Danny Hillis, um, who later founded the Connection Machine, and uh, uh, David uh, McLeese, who was a businessman, had started a company uh, called Terrapin uh, to sell floor turtles. 
Um, and Terrapin had mostly uh, gone out of business, um, but I had an interest in, uh, in the company and uh, worked with some other friends to try to keep it uh, going during the lean times. So uh, I came up with the idea that we would reanimate Terrapin, uh, find someone to run it, and I would go there. We'd purchase a license from MIT, which was all royalty-based, um, and uh, I would continue to work to enhance Lobo from there um, and uh, take that and uh, we'd sell it to schools. Uh, so we did that. Uh, David McLeese's brother, Jock McLeese, um, who had, uh, was uh, an economist, um, uh, took over the reins of running the company. And the company uh, collected a number of people together, uh, people who wrote, uh, developed curriculum materials, wrote books, uh, you know, marketing and sales and so on. Um, and uh, Terrapin was doing quite well, but around the same time, um, the folks who had originally done uh, um, the uh, logo for the T994 and for some of the other machines um, decided that uh, now was the time, um, and so the company that had uh, long before previously uh, tried to make logo on the PDP-11, um, uh, they uh, that individual came back. Uh, he was Canadian. He came back and he started a competing company. Um, and he had some, some mm. money, so they were quite well funded. Terrapin was a little bit of a shoestring operation. It was called Logo Computer Systems Incorporated, or LCSI. So uh, Terrapin and uh, LCSI found themselves competing for very con various contracts, uh, IBM, Apple. Um, Apple awarded the uh, contract for the official uh, Apple II logo to uh, LCSI. Um, and uh, Terrapin was looking for uh, other, other uh, avenues, other things to sell. Um, in the meantime, uh, a couple of other companies uh, got licenses to, uh, uh, to, uh, from MIT, uh, a company called Krell Corporation. They distinguished themselves on, on low cost. They didn't do any, uh, uh, they didn't do any, uh, any development work. They didn't have the ability to, and they ran a kind of a negative advertising campaign. It was a little unpleasant time. Um, and uh, in fact, I had to go back to MIT to make changes for them. Uh, uh, to uh, to give back to Krell, for, so uh, they wanted to put their copyright on it. So I was the one who wrote the code to write the copyright for for this competitor. It was very strange. Um, and uh, um, uh, another uh, another time, I uh, um, was uh, called to go to Japan to help a company uh, port uh, logo from the 6502 to the 6809. Um, and uh, we did that and compiled it, uh, assembled it on a fax a fax machine, a fax 750. Um, that left me with a very, uh, with an interest in uh, Japan and Japanese linguistics, and I later studied Japanese, and that helped me a lot in my career. So that was an interesting time. Um, I worked on uh, German translations, learned a lot about that. Um, there were some bootleg translations. I also saw one in Bulgarian, for example, was kind of interesting. I helped with the French version, although French it was well trodden at that point. Um, so that was a fun time, uh, but uh, Terrapin was looking to compete, uh, looking to his, uh, uh, to uh, distinguish itself and to uh, develop new avenues for bringing Logo out. Um, so uh, I was looking in a Scientific American magazine and I saw an ad for the VIC-20 computer. Um, so I thought that was very interesting and it looked like it might be able to, to, uh, run, uh, to run Logo. Um, we would had some talks with Atari. Atari had um, 48K of memory. Uh, but they also had uh, every one of their peripherals had, had uh, I believe, had a 6502 in it as well. Um, so we proposed a um, 6502 coprocessor that would have 64K of RAM and would uh, would run the logo, and then we would communicate over a serial port and just use the Atari for the graphics. And uh, had some meetings with the Atari folks. They were not very interested in that. LCSI got that contract, and they uh, they made logo fit. Uh, but unfortunately, there was almost no room for anyone to write programs. So it was uh, logo in name only. It was very, very uh, uh, hobbled and limited. Um, so I'm glad we didn't uh, take that project. So the VIC-20 was, uh, was interesting, even though it only had 16K of RAM. Uh, but I figured we could work something out, uh, like uh, maybe a proposal like we had with Atari. Uh, so I came back and talked to um, David McLeese, uh, sorry, Jock McLeese, who was the president, and uh, told him about my find. Um, and. Uh, uh, he just straight up called uh, Commodore main number on the phone and asked to speak to the president and told him what he wanted to do. Uh, so he got routed uh, to someone, I don't know if he spoke to Jack Tremiel or not, probably one of the VPs, but they said, well, coincidentally, we've heard about Logo and we'd like to have a competitor for what Apple has, uh, so why don't you come on out? Um, so straight away we went to, uh, we went to King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, 
um, and uh, uh, Jock and I went, and uh, we uh, went for a uh, uh, a brief meeting. Uh, Andy Finkel was there, so I met him, um, and uh, the the uh, VP of the software div uh, division. I can't remember his name. All I remember it was he was. Uh, from TRW, had come from satellites and TRW before, and he might have been German. I can't remember. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, we talked with him, and they they told us they were coming up with uh, a new machine that would have more memory and uh, uh, more features, and uh, would be a great competitor. They thought for the uh, Apple II and the Atari, um, and they were very interested in the education market and very uh, interested in making something that would be cost uh, good uh, good uh, cost point. So basically, they awarded us the contract, um, and uh, I went back again uh, to uh, Pennsylvania um, and attended a seminar with uh, uh, maybe 15 other folks. Um, and uh, Andy was the main presenter, um, and they talked about the uh, Commodore 64 design, uh, how it was coming out. Um, I don't recall any demos. I think that it, the, there wasn't anything for us to see, um, and uh, they took all sorts of questions um, and. Uh, um, let's see, I told them that uh, we needed as much page zero memory as possible uh, and that uh, we would uh, not going to be using their ROM calls for very much at all uh, because of speed and it certainly didn't need the basic. Uh, so they said that it would, uh, that they'd make sure that we could uh, swap out the uh, basic ROM, uh, there was a 4K ROM, so we could swap that ROM out so we could have full 64K address space uh, and we could swap it back in if we needed to make uh, disk calls for example. Um, they um, uh, and uh, they also told us that the uh, graphics chip, it was going to be called the VIC-2 chip, I think, uh, that uh, uh, I told them we needed to support split-screen mode like the Apple II had so that you could uh, type at the bottom and see the turtle moving around at the top or you could go to full-screen text mode if you wanted to write some kind of list-like program for doing Pig Latin or something. Those things were very popular. Um, so uh, they said that uh, we'd have the opportunity to, uh, to present those and when I came back uh, they brought three guys in um, and they did not tell us their names and I'm not going to tell you their names because I was told, to, uh, I was told not to say anything. Uh, one of them was named uh, Bob, I remember, and they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't let us, uh, they wouldn't refer to each other. Uh, but they were the designers of the uh, VIC, the SID, and the 6502 chip. Um, and uh, they were just terribly concerned that we were going to try to hire them away. It was a very interesting thing. Commodore was very secretive about, about who their employees were. Um, so I raised my concerns and they told me that, uh, that we, could do, uh, um, we could use, I think, a 60 hertz NMI or something to uh, be able to swap uh, the uh, VIC display mode to go from text to color. And I told them that it would be very distracting to kids and teachers if that caused any type of um, jitter that we really needed to make sure that that interrupt was serviced very quickly. And they said it wouldn't be a problem. Um, and uh, they gave me, uh, eventually, a, uh, a uh, kernel ROM listing. Um, and uh, that was printed on, uh, I think it was blue on green paper or vice versa. Uh, and I think there were alternating blue and green bars as well. So it was uh, designed to be very difficult to, to copy with the uh, light lens copy technology um, uh, of the day. Uh, nobody had color scanners back then, of course. Um, and uh, so I had that and I was able to look at the routines I needed to call and see which page zero registers were used um, and uh, began the task of porting Logo to, from the uh, Apple II to the uh, Commodore 64 at Terrapin. Um, meanwhile Terrapin had uh, moved offices a couple of times um, and uh, um, I got to the point where um, I was having to debug things and one of the things that I had to debug uh, was the use of uh, memory locations 0 and 1. Um, and uh, if you know Lisp, you know that uh, nil is a concept that's very important. It's the end of the list and it's used for a bunch of other things. And we used locations 0 and 1 and 2 and 3 uh, to represent the point of the memory pointers um, for uh, nil. Uh, and then if you took the uh, what Logo calls head and uh, or, or first and butt first or head and tail in, uh, lo in uh, Lisp, it's card cutter. Um, we had a lot of situations where we'd expect to be able to dereference this a uh, number of times and still wind up with, uh, with um, you know, pointer back to zero. So we made sure that all four of those locations had zero in them. Um, unfortunately, on the Commodore 64, the 6510 chip, uh, the locations zero and one were the uh, control and data registers for the uh, external serial bus that talked to the disk and so on. Uh, even reading from them was dangerous. So 
um, I had to find and fix lots of code paths that were not doing null checks for locations 0 and 1. Um, and that proved to be very difficult. Um, additionally, there were areas that were, uh, that were um, there were just not enough page 0 registers to go around, uh, even uh, after I took into account uh, which ones were being used. So I had to uh, do some work to make sure that, uh, that we shared them properly and saved and restored them with, uh, with um, uh, around the disk calls and uh, some types of interrupts that got serviced, I think the keyboard or something. Uh, and those were difficult to track down as well. Um, so I presented this problem to Andy, who was very responsive. Um, and uh, I can't remember if I went out again or not, but uh, they eventually sent us a Commodore PET, which I'd never seen before. I'd only seen them in uh, magazines. Um, and a uh, uh, special 6510 that they fabbed. I believe they said the yield was 12. Um, and uh, this 6510 uh, was in a ZIF socket and then um, had uh, some other things on it, I don't remember. Uh, and they brought out an extra line, which was the instruction data decode address decode line. So it told uh, whether the 6510 was fetching an instru uh, instructions or data. Um, and as you know, the 6502 architecture has a three-stage instruction pipeline that overlaps the ID fetch and, the, and a, bit of the, uh, a bit of the execution engine. Um, so with this in hand, we're able to use a Nikolay Paratronic 16-channel logic analyzer uh, to decode uh, properly decode the fetches. Um, and uh, Commodore had written a on-the-fly disassembler. So you could um, execute with this chip. You clipped on top uh, of the uh, with a, a uh, um, sort of bed of nails type thing. Not exactly, but all these pins came out. And that went into the uh, that went into the logic analyzer, and that went over the uh, uh, the I guess it's an IEEE 488 bus to the uh, uh, to the uh, uh, Commodore PET, which had a disassembler and controller written in BASIC. And with that, I was able to, uh, for example, watch for reads or writes to location zero, um, essentially set breakpoints. And the fascinating thing, and this is something that I that uh, we still don't have, and I'd like to have it, I could s see what the up to 256 instructions were uh, prior to the time that the uh, read or write to those that page zero register or that location happened. Um, so this was great. It was like time travel. I could set breakpoints in the past. Um, and this would show me the execution path uh, of the code that led up to that point. Uh, and I could look at that and trace through the code and figure out um, um, what, um, you know, what, uh, what would be the best path to take for the code to make sure that we, uh, we, didn't, um, you know, we didn't read or write from location zero or, or whatever, whatever the other problem was. And after that development uh, sped up rapidly um, and Terrapin moved again. Um, and we uh, began to uh, get, you know, a workable, non-crashing version of Logo for the Commodore 64. Um, I took it, uh, and uh, there was a in Harvard Square in Cambridge, Mass. There was a uh, Commodore. There was a computer sales store, computer store, and they uh, they had a uh, Commodore 64 there. And sometimes I would take the disc in and boot up the Logo and uh, and leave it there, and people would come in and play with it. And I got to see what was going on. And of course, if you didn't have the disc, you couldn't get anything uh, done. So. Uh, people uh, people would just play with it a bit, and it, it wasn't uh, wasn't any concern that it was an early release. Um, and uh, we also built a, um, a utilities disc. Uh, so there was a 14 year old named Don Hopkins, um, and um, uh, Don uh, had, wrote an adventure game. So you could type north or south or east or west, and uh, that he defined as logo commands. And as you moved through the rooms, um, it would. Uh, Load the room file into in uh, as a logo program using the load command off the disk uh, automatically, um, and uh, so that's how he was able to make more than what uh, would fit in memory uh, be part of this adventure game. Uh, and Don Don was a, uh, a bit of an iconoclast and also very bright, of course. Um, he later went on to uh, be one of the engineers on the Sims uh, on the Sims, the game that involved uh, simulated people and so on. Um, and uh, a few other things like that, and still active in the industry. Um, uh, anyway, we, uh, we put that on the utilities disk, and uh, sort of tongue-in-cheek, I wrote, here's a logo program written by a typical 14-year-old, which of course it wasn't, but it gave everyone something to shoot for. Um, another thing we put on the utility disk that I brought over, and this was from the, I had written this at MIT, uh, I wrote a 6502 assembler in logo, um, so you could write your own um, uh, assembly code, you load A, store A, etc. Um, 
and uh, write those as logo procedures. And they would not execute, but that was a way of storing the information. And then it was a, 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 a two-pass assembler, um, and it would assemble the code, and then you would store it in the memory, and then you could call it with a, a, a something called point call, or we'd say dot call today. Um, so I put that uh, in, and uh, I've often wondered if anybody learned 6502 assembly programming from uh, uh, from using Logo in the Commodore 64 or perhaps the uh, Apple II. One of my regrets about the uh, Commodore 64 is that although it had a sprite chip, just like the um, just like the Atari and the uh, TI-994 had. Um, uh, I never uh, found enough time or uh, room in uh, in the memory to uh, write the code to uh, have the sprite ships have a velocity. So it was it was only under direct control. You could move things around under control of Logo, but unlike the TI-994 and um, uh, and uh, Atari logos, uh, the uh, the sprites didn't have a velocity on the um, uh, on the uh, on the C64. Interestingly, the sprite chip uh, came out of, that came out of TI was a uh, master's thesis project from Danny Hillis, who had uh, been uh, the the uh, initial founder of uh, one of the two initial founders of uh, of Terrapin. So it was all a lot of very connected stuff going on there in the uh, in the logo community. Um, so they were fun times. Um, we uh, we released logo um, for the Apple II, the Commodore 64. Um, later, in, in uh, a couple of years later, for the uh, for the Mac, um, all from Terrapin. Uh, LCSI had uh, uh, logo for the IBM PC uh, again for the uh, Atari 800, of course, and for the uh, and for the Apple II. They did the branded versions. Um, we. Um, uh, we also worked on logo for the Sinclair XL, which is a, a strange machine, uh, 68,000 based, I think, square keys. Uh, it never came to fruition, but it was very interesting. It never really happened in the U.S. Um, so there were a lot of fun times we had, and uh, at one point, logo was in use by one quarter of the elementary schools in the U.S. Um, and in fact, teachers would call me at home on the phone uh, to ask questions, so I... Uh, I changed my name in the phone book to uh, Gloria Mundy because I knew it was a uh, temporary, uh, temporary thing. So uh, my 15 minutes of fame was uh, sick trends at Gloria Mundy. Thus goes the glory of the world. Um, and we used to get uh, we used to get all sorts of cute things mailed back to us from uh, these various logo implementations. One of the favorites was um, uh, logo was on the uh, uh, was on a disc. It was on a floppy disk, you know. Um, and uh, the computer at an elementary school was usually in the library. They usually only had one or two of them. Um, so the librarians would get, um, the, uh, get the package, and they had a book, so they knew what to do with the book. They put it on the shelf. Um, and then they'd get the floppy disk, and they knew what to do with that, too. It was a media item, so they would staple a, uh, a catalog card to it. Uh, and then after that, of course, the disk would never work. So we had an entire collection of... Um, of uh, floppy disks with card catalog cards stapled to them that uh, got mailed back to us. And uh, another thing that often happened, uh, this was less so on the Commodore version because uh, it was um, a little more bulletproof, but in the uh, Apple II version, uh, we had versions out in the field that uh, were not upgraded uh, and uh, they would crash. And uh, uh, we had it print out, uh, type, you know, I forget exactly what it was, uh, the uh, addresses, dot some addresses, and it would print out the stack. Uh, and I said, write down those numbers and send them to us on a postcard, uh, and say what you were doing. Um, and it never occurred to me that uh, that people wouldn't give me a you know a precise uh, answer about what they were doing, you know, there were what command they were using or so on. Uh, so we would uh, get a lot of postcards that say things like, uh, I was drawing a house, um, or uh, this was in use with second graders, you know. Uh, so those th most of those uh, most of those bug reports were um, not uh, not actionable, and the ones that were. Uh, were usually garbage collection bugs that we had long since fixed, um, and uh, so we would just send those folks in a, a new updated disk, and uh, and they would move on. Uh, with Commodore, it was uh, a little more difficult. Um, uh, Commodore sold the product retail through their channel, um, and uh, Terrapin purchased at wholesale a number of disks and uh, a number of packages, and able to uh, was able to sell those. Um, the uh, to cost reduce, uh, Commodore took the book. Uh, I believe the editor on the for on the uh, Commodore side was April Koppenhauer, or Koppenhauer, uh, and uh, on the Terrapin side it was Mark Eckenweiler, um, and uh, they just photo reduced it to a smaller size, uh, so it would fit in the package and cost them a lot less. 
Um, and then when Logo started selling uh, well, um, sold in excess of 100, 150,000 copies, uh, they just unilaterally decided to reduce the payments that they were going to pay. I think it was um, I think it was a 20% royalty, so it would have been $20 per copy, um, and they were selling Logo for 100. <clears throat> and uh, I got to double dip on that because Terrapin paid me royalties and MIT paid me royalties as they did some of the other authors. Um, so Commodore reduced the uh, reduced the royalty payments to one dollar per copy from from twenty dollars, um, and they said, well, if you uh, you know if you don't like that, we just won't market your product. Um, so there was not really much to be done about that, um, but uh, it uh, you know they did keep true to their promise. They kept the price point. Uh, they they marketed the product. They sold it. Um, it really got out there to uh, to kids in schools and. Uh, the you know the C64 I think started off at 5.99 in the U.S. Uh, and went on to become uh, the best-selling computer a single model uh, for a very long time. I think that record has only recently been surpassed in the in the past couple of years. But uh, the the model that uh, the model that it's that it sold the effect that it had uh, on kids and teachers. You know I still run into people uh, to this day in my field um, who uh, who learned to program from. Uh, logo the programming language for um, the Apple II or the C64 or uh, one of the other machines that we ported it to. So it was a fascinating and, and lovely time of my life um, and I uh, met some great people. Uh, we got some uh, fun stuff done and uh, I was able to uh, take what I got paid for that, go back to school and uh, finish, uh, finish my education. So I'm uh, thankful to uh, Logo and to, um, and to Commodore for this experience. Uh, Lee, was uh, Logo developed for the Commodore Plus 4? So the uh, Plus 4 was originally going to be called the uh, Plus 4, but I believe they called it the 264. Um, and uh, that was Andy Finkel's product. He was the product manager for that. Um, there were a couple of other products that did not come out uh, in between, um, and Andy was determined that this one would come out. Um, the, two, the 264 uh, they wanted to call it the Plus 4, but they couldn't get a trademark on it because of uh, knickers or some kind of uh, uh, shorts that were four inches longer. Um, so somehow they felt they couldn't do that, although field of use would have been good. Um, so uh, um, for the 264, we made a, uh, we made a logo ROM, um, and 50,000 of those ROMs were made. Um, and uh, it's possible I have one somewhere, although I haven't seen it in a while. Um, but uh, the Commodore 264 had, uh, it was kind of like the Lotus Suite. You could plug in different, uh, different programs and run them. Um, and uh, it did sell, you know, they were true to Andy, they were true to their promise, but it never really had the, break, the breakthrough that it, uh, that it was supposed to. Um, and uh, I think they eventually uh, landfilled most of those uh, cartridges. The Commodore 16 was a cost-reduced Commodore 64 with, uh, with uh, uh, less RAM. Um, and uh, I believe we made that work. Uh, I'm not sure, and I, I don't even actually know if the Commodore 16 made it to the market. Um, and then there was the Commodore 128, uh, which had some kind of bank switching thing, um, and uh, I believe we made it work on that. Um, I think I worked on that. It's possible uh, that uh, someone else helped on that, helped uh, helped out on that. Um, there was another guy who helped out uh, a bit, um, Devin McCullough, he's still around. Uh, I, uh, we paid him to do some work on uh, garbage collection, uh, fixing some things. There was uh, uh, GCTWA, it was called. Um, all of the words that you typed in to Logo also were stored, and eventually you could call this separate point .GCTWA operation to uh, delete those the copies of the words that were typed in, not the programs, not the list, but just the words themselves. It was seldom used, and it took five or six seconds. But sometimes it was really what you needed to do in order to uh, be able to, uh, you know, save your program out or something. Um, wasn't uh, wasn't that big a deal. Um, oh, and the uh, the um, I wrote the technical uh, uh, chapters at the end uh, of the book um, um, uh, for the uh, for the manual. I got uh, Ginny Grammer, Virginia Grammer, who'd been a teacher uh, in early logo work, and uh, Paul, another guy. Uh, who also was involved, who was a PhD student at the time, but of course, you know, had come back. Uh, they did uh, much of the uh, tutorial and educational material, and I did the technical section, and as I mentioned, Mark Eckenweiler did the editing. Um, but um, the uh, multicolor mode, uh, there were two modes. There were uh, more pixels and fewer colors, and fewer pixels and more colors. Um, and in uh, multicolor mode, um, 
the promise that the Vic, the Vic Chip people made uh, did not come to fruition. There was still a bit of jitter uh, going on there. Um, and uh, if you went into split screen multicolor mode, you could see the status line sort of waver around a bit, and you get these little pixels at the left and the right. Um, so uh, uh, I uh, put in an index, uh, I put in an a, a, uh, entry in the technical section and said that this is the multicolor status line and exists to show you that you're in multicolor mode. And then I wrote, uh, this is normal and should be no cause for concern. And there were a few other uh, jokes in the manual. There's one reference to uh, the Firesign Theater, we're all bozos on this bus. Um, uh, the, uh, I believe it's uh, sometimes the point option commands are, are uh, only vaguely related to the uh, names that they modify, but there they are. Uh, so a little like having bees in your head if uh, anybody knows the Firesign Theater. Um, so we had a lot of fun, and uh, we were able to uh, bring it out for a number of a uh, number of products from Commodore, but none were as successful as the C64. There was a logo for the Commodore 128. Was that commercially produced? That I don't know. Um, there were some bank switching things we did, um, and I don't uh, remember if it uh, if uh, if it was finished, uh, oh. if they sold it or not. But I, I know we did work on we did some work on that. The 264 was fairly easy. Uh, because it was, you know, just basically rom, uh, romming something up. Um, and the 16 had some challenges of memory. I, I just don't remember what we did on that. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, around that era also is about the time the Mac came out. Uh, so uh, Patrick Sobovaro and I started a project with Terrapin to uh, write logo in C uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the Mac, and we, uh, that's, that's where we focused our energies after that time. Yes, I have never heard of logo for the Commodore 128, so they, that may be a uh, mystery item there that yeah, it's, never uh, got developed. It, it's possible that we uh, that uh, that uh, it never got finished. Mm. Very good. Well, thank you, Lee, for all your time. It's a lot of fun uh, seeing the C64. I've got one out in the garage. I don't have the uh, 15. What is it? 1561. I don't have the disk drive, um, so uh, couldn't load logo. Um, uh, but. Um, do have some copies uh, out there. I've got the manuals, um, and uh, love to uh, 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 love to play with that. I saw uh, saw it at the uh, uh, Maker Fair 2017 in the Bay Area, um, and uh, saw the uh, saw the logo there, um, and uh, the uh, books. Uh, so it's good to see that people uh, uh, still care uh, about uh, about this product. Thanks. Thank you.